We're here for the sake of true happiness. That's why the Buddha left his palace, went out into the wilderness, because he wasn't satisfied with the happiness that comes in normal, everyday life. He wanted a happiness that was dependable, a happiness that was really worth all the effort that would go into it, because all kinds of happiness require effort in one way or another. And the question is always, is the effort worth it? And in terms of fabricated things, conditioned things, many times the, the answer is no. In fact, if you take any conditioned thing and make it the purpose of your practice, the purpose of your quest for happiness, the effort is not worth it. But the Buddha realized that conditioned things have another side as well. Not only are they conditioned, they are conditioning. In other words, as conditioned things, they depend on other causes, and they arise and fall in line with those causes arising and falling away, sometimes immediately, sometimes over time. But then they themselves give rise to other things. And the Buddha's major discovery was that even though these certain things are conditioned, in other words, the elements of the path are conditioned, they can lead to an opening to the unconditioned. This is what makes the path worthwhile. In other words, life is not all hopeless. In Thai there's a term for this state that some people get into and all they can see is the bad side of conditioned things. Everything passes away, passes away, passes away. It seems like there's everything is hopeless. And it's called narrow equanimity. Small-minded equanimity. In other words, you get in disenchanted with everything, but the disenchantment doesn't lead to the opening that's required to the deathless. Just stay stuck there on the disenchanted side. And if you stay stuck there, it's very easy to get hopeless, depressed. But the Buddha pointed out there is this other side to condition things as well. So you've got to see them from both sides. There is the potential for true happiness that lies here in the practice. If we're doing conditioned things, right view, right resolve, all the way down to right concentration, these are all conditioned things. As the Buddha said, they are the highest of all conditioned things. Highest in the sense that you don't stop there. They are a path. They open up to something even bigger. So make sure you look at life from both sides. In other words, you focus on the, the drawbacks of taking conditioned things as your, as your goal, so that you don't get complacent. Sometimes it's easy. You get a nice, calm state in meditation. Life around you seems pretty easy, and it's very easy, and it happens to many, many people. That you say, this is fine enough right here. So in cases like that, the Buddha points out all the drawbacks of conditioned things, all the drawbacks of conditioned happiness. Not only the work that goes into it, sometimes in order to maintain it, you start doing things that go against the precepts, that go against the principles of morality and concentration and insight, so that your conditioned happiness doesn't send results simply in it passing away, but it also leads to all kinds of bad things down the road. So you have to watch out. You can't be complacent. But then on the other side, he stresses the fact that heedfulness really does pay off. If everything were negative, then no matter how heedful or careful you might be, then there'd be no chance for any true happiness. But he said it's, it's his heedfulness that makes the distinction. That's the good side to heedfulness, that if you are careful, if you are circumspect, it will make a big difference. So in our lives, we have to make, ask ourselves exactly what kind of happiness are we going to pursue. And we have to be single-minded in the practice, because it's so easy to stray off in other directions. And some of the side roads are blatantly bad. Others are it's relatively good, and it's easy to talk yourself into 
saying, well, this is, this is a good thing to do. There's nothing wrong with doing this. And in a general sense, yes, that's right. But it's, if it's still second best, if it's not all the way to the unconditioned, you can't stop there. You can't let yourself stop there. You can't let yourself turn off the road there. You've got to be very careful. The problem is that when we come to the practice, we're, we're people of many minds. We don't have that single-minded determination. And John Munn, in his last Dharma talk, talked about that as being the essential element of the practice, a single-minded single determination not to come back. Let the defilements step all over you as, as before, not to come back to suffer. But that determination is something that we have to develop over time. We don't come into the practice this way. We may be two or three minds about the whole thing. And this is what training the mind is all about, is getting the mind to that sort of single-minded purpose, single-minded intention. And this is what the precepts do. They show us exactly where our minds are not single-minded. You have to focus in on your intentions all the time, whenever you're doing anything. And as you get to know your intentions, you begin to realize it's like a committee in there. Sometimes it's not just a committee, it's a whole crowd. And so as we make the mind still in concentration, that's not the kind of single-mindedness we're talking about, but it is a basic prerequisite. We take one intention and run with it as far as we can, because we'll, and we're inevitably we'll find there are other intentions that come in and counteract it. And in the beginning, it's easy for the intention to stay with the breath, to stay with the meditation. It's bound to be weak, and it's easy to get knocked off course. But it's, as you get a greater sense of feeling at home here, at ease here, you develop greater powers of resistance to getting knocked off, because it feels really good to be here. I feel this is the right place to be. And then you can start taking on the various other intentions that come. You take them apart to understand what. Why do they seem to have such force? We overcome distraction, we overcome the defilements of the mind, not by pushing them away and pretending they're not there. We have to understand them, and understand them means the ability to watch them from a good, solid standpoint. That's why we have the concentration. And as you keep coming up, you find, well, this isn't really an intention that I'd want to abide by, and that's not really an intention I want to abide by. So you cut them away, cut them away until you've run into some really big ones, important ones. Then sometimes they'll knock you off base again, which is a sign that your concentration needs further development, your insight needs further development. The path of practice is not a smooth, straight line on a graph. It has its ups and downs. It has its drama. There's that series of books that Warder did on Indian literature. And he starts out with a, a theory behind it. One of the basic theories of any story is that it has to have setbacks in order to be interesting, and, and also in order to be realistic. And the practice of the Dharma is bound to have setbacks. But if you keep reminding yourself of why you're here, it's for true happiness, genuine happiness. The happiness is not going to let you down. You look at all the other happiness as you get from getting off the path, and you begin to realize, after a while, they all let you down one way or another. And this realization helps pull you back on the path. And so that ultimately you can start cutting through a lot of the big distractions, a lot of the big defilements. It's, it's a similar practice, similar technique. You see where it's causing stress, see what you're doing, see that you don't have to do that. You can stop. You can let it go. And it's the same principle. It's simply that with stronger powers of concentration, stronger mindfulness, stronger alertness, you can cut through things that you couldn't cut through before. And over time, that single-minded determination not to let yourself suffer gets stronger and stronger, and it has a larger and larger role in the committee discussions until finally it is the voice. It's the anonymous voice in the mind. Because all the other voices have been eliminated. Either that or they've been converted. But even though you may find there are still these traitorous voices in your mind, remember the important voice is this one, the one resolved 
not to stop short of genuine happiness. Try to strengthen that voice as much as you can, because that's the voice that saw the Buddha through. I mean, if you look at all the setbacks that he encountered in his practice, finding teachers and then realizing that they couldn't take him all the way, going as far as austerities could take him, then realizing that did not go all the way either. And then he was stuck, because all the alternatives had been suggested in his, in his culture. He had tried, and they hadn't worked. But again, he wasn't. He was determined not to give up. And it's that determination that gives you the strength to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep going. So make sure that that determination stays nurtured, because that's what will see you through.